So hi, everyone. Welcome to our third in the session of four on dismantling racism and oppression in faith-based investing. And we're glad you're here. I know many of you have been with us, but and not to be repetitive, but just to say that um, Pam and Diane and I are all members of the American Sustainable Business Network as Investor Circle members and realized during the time of COVID that the entrepreneurs that we cared about were not being supported by the big banks and that the CDFIs were the, the real angels on the street. So Pam Porter has been a tremendous resource and has helped us compile a list of investable CDFIs who share our mission for community-based investments. And just so you know, we are starting with CDFIs, but there is so much more depth as Derek will tell you about the churches that are going to be sold in the next five years and the community-based funds that we can get involved in and really impacting the places that we live and care about. So know that this is just the beginning and um, we're glad you're joining us on this journey. We hope you'll join us on the 14th of November. We have a session I'll pop in the chat from one to two where people can just ask questions. It's an informal session uh, for people to share their successes, their frustrations, their excitement and um, see where we wanna take this in 2023. So I wanna thank you all for joining us. Really glad to have Emily joining us who is um, from Colorado. Thanks to one of our members, Tom Abood and Eric, who's going to be moderating this panel and is deeply entrenched in this faith work. And I just want to thank you for being here and hope you'll join us on the 14th and help us shape this work going forward. So thank you. Thank you, Babby. And um, I just want to thank uh, Babby for organizing this series. She's put a lot of effort into making sure that the information gets out and organizing the panelists uh, that we have for you tonight. And so I just wanted to give a big thank you um, to Babby and the panelists that um, will be sharing um, their stories with you tonight. And so just wanted to welcome everybody. Um, my name is Derek Peebles. I am the director of policy and advocacy for inclusive economy at ASBN. And like Babby said, this has been a series of conversations that have been focused on um, investing in ways of beloved community um, in ways that dismantle racism. And we started this project, you know, and recognizing that as individuals and institutions pursue more traditional investment opportunities, investors typically find that an organization's values don't always align or are in direct opposition to their value systems. And so thankfully an alternative form of investing does exist that accounts for the social, ethical and environmental concerns of investors. And that's why we call this faith-based uh, community investing. And, and so just to speak a little bit on beloved community, um, faith-based community investing uh, can most effectively be achieved uh, through the framework of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, coined in his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Um, Chaos or Community, King called on people of diverse backgrounds and identities to come together uh, in an interdependent relationship of love and mutual respect that seeks to realize justice within the community and in the broader world. And so incorporating beloved community into the faith-based investment structure can have a really powerful impact on our communities, not only financially, but socially and environmentally as well. Um, so our aim is to, to raise awareness, um, you know, for the opportunities to invest in CDFIs. And just to give you just kind of a little bit of information on some of the things that are coming down the pipeline, which is why we think this is important, is that in the next five years, we will need to deal with um, about 60,000 church buildings that will become vacant again over the next five years. And so moving these properties to the tax base could provide funds for more equitable development. And that's one of the reasons why this is important. But also um, congregations will be receiving massive inflows of capital from churches 
closing and selling their property um, that they can align with mission. And so these are the kind of a couple of things that are kind of top of mind for me uh, and why this is important. Um, right. We're starting uh, this series by focusing on CDFIs, but we're going to be meeting on November 14th and we're going to be gathering just to, for people who have participated to talk about other ways of faith-based uh, community investing. And we we'll hope you all are able to join that as well. And then I'll speak a little bit briefly on that at the end. Um, so before we invite our panelists, I wanted to take a second and just explain, I actually put in the chat when we got started, um, for the participants that we have, I would like if you all could go ahead and just kind of introduce yourself in the chat by just listing your name and um, also just kind of listing whether or not you're engaging uh, in this session as an individual or as part of a congregation or as part of a denomination, or it could be all three. And so um, you could do that in the chat by just listing your name and then list the I next to your name if you're engaging as an individual. You could list a C next to your name if you're engaging as part of a congregation or and or list D next to your name if you're part of a denomination as well. Um, so uh, just a little disclaimer on that. And before our panelists get started, I would like to turn it over to another person that's been very critical in setting up these series and that's Pam Porter. Pam? Um, thank you so much, Derek. Um, it's just been such a privilege and pleasure to work with with you and um, our other, and Babby and the other panelists um, on this. And I just wanna start by saying, um, you know, the typical disclaimer, we are not offering investment advice and, um, you know, please do consult your own um, advisors um, just, to, just to be cautious. But what I'd like to do is spend about 15 minutes um, talking a little bit about the CDFI industry. Um, and if you've joined us on any of our previous webinars, we had a chance to talk about what are CDFIs, hear examples of CDFIs that individuals and um, congregations um, have invested in. Um, our first series was hearing from four different faith leaders from different faith traditions talking about how their um, congregation or denomination has um, started their, um, their uh, investment program and how they've worked with CDFIs. Our second session, we heard from three individuals um, who are connected with different faith organizations, but as individuals, they have started putting their own personal savings to work um, aligned with their values and the goal of um, dismantling racism and inequality. Um, and so today, um, we don't wanna repeat um, what we've covered. We wanna go a little bit deeper, but we know that we wanna have a common vocabulary. So we are gonna do a little bit of a CDFI overview and then talk about the specific um, investment opportunities um, that exist um, to invest in CDFIs and um, some resources for, um, for doing um, due diligence. Um, there's a lot more we can talk about, but we want to, you know, we want to just continue down, um, down this path. So, um, and then you're going to hear from Emily and Diane, who are going to tell um, their own stories about how as members of their congregations, um, they have started their, um, their um, investment journeys. And then we're gonna open it up for your questions and Derek's gonna moderate. And um, so here we go. Um, so I, I wanted to start with this graphic. Many of you may have seen this 
Um, an earlier version of it was very widely distributed as part of the Heron Foundation. But this is um, basically a framework for looking at the wide variety of investment types or asset classes that fall in the overall impact investing um, sphere. And it ranges from on the right side, market rate investments to the, uh, to the left side, which are below market rate investments. And, and we're gonna talk about some of these, um, but I wanted to just start with this frame because um, a lot of times it's helpful to know that as I'm thinking about um, personal investing or probably more likely as I'm thinking about my institution, my faith-based organization or endowment or foundation, there's a framework for thinking about the, um, the balance between rate of return and impact and recognizing that there's a place in the portfolio for a, a range of different types of, of investments that have different perspectives. Now, today, as um, Babby and Derek mentioned, we're gonna start by focusing on CDFIs, um, Community Development Financial Institutions. And we want to do that for two reasons. First of all, um, CDFI investments can hit a lot of places along that continuum, but also um, they are a fairly easy way to get started and to scale um, a, uh, in an investment program that is focused on impact, community um, change, and, um, and they have a really great decades long track record that, um, that makes them an effective, um, an effective way to get started. Um, so I just high level, many of you already know this, but CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, are a program of the U.S. Department of Treasury. Um, they um, they uh, were established a few decades ago um, as part of the Community Development Act. Um, and they are basically financial intermediaries that have a primary purpose of serving low-income communities and historically underserved communities. They need to choose uh, a target market. They need to understand the needs of that target market, be accountable to that target market, and do reporting um, that demonstrates that they are focused on responsible products and services that have impact in that, um, in that community. All CDFIs offer a range of different types of financial products and services, but they all must offer technical assistance, consulting, development services to help their borrowers and customers succeed. And they are part of the community. They offer, um, they offer a lot of services to help their community succeed. And that's really the secret sauce of these, um, these organizations. Um, if you've met one CDFI that does one kind of lending, uh, recognize you have met one CDFI that does one kind of lending. CDFIs are quite varied and the types of lending that they do. Um, it takes a lot of different types of, of lending and activity to, to revitalize communities and to address the um, the needs of, um, of poverty and racism in our communities. And CDFIs tend to focus on one or two areas and let the other CDFIs uh, focus on their areas of specialty. But I, I would say most C, the, the most common areas that CDFIs focus on are affordable housing, whether that is housing um, for ownership or for rental, whether it's single family, um, multifamily community facilities such as community health centers, um, child care centers, um, um, educational institutions, business lending, whether it's large businesses or small businesses, micro lenders. Um, there's a wide variety of creativity in that area and also consumer lending. 
So for home repairs, for being able to open a, a bank account, um, to be able to grow savings, um, you know, these are just, uh, these are some of the major areas that CDFIs um, focus on. Um, so just to give you a visual, so what is it that CDFIs are doing? So we, and why, why are we connected to it? So, so everyone here, we um, are assuming our audience um, represent sources of capital. So we, we would say mission or impact investors. And you are joined by foundations across the country, banks that have a responsibility to serve all the communities in their footprint, policymakers at the federal, state, and local level, religious institutions, such as many of you, as well as individuals um, who have a desire to have their investments have impact in communities. CDFIs, represented by this yellow bar in the middle, are the intermediaries. They take the sources of capital and then they um, make loans or offer financial services in their communities to the borrowers and customers in those communities, provide those extra services um, that help build stronger communities, um, that reach brown and black communities at a much higher, more successful rate than traditional financial institutions. And guess what? Those borrowers and customers succeed. They are able to repay their loans. They are able to um, uh, develop savings accounts and start to build, um, build wealth. They're able to buy homes, um, fix up their homes, and repay those loans. And that circle you see in the middle represents the money comes back to the CDFI. They relend it into the community until it's time to repay it um, to the investors. And um, there have been many studies. Most recently, Janet Yellen, Secretary of the Treasury, has often said at meetings where she has praised the work of CDFIs, um, especially during this pandemic time, by saying that a dollar invested in a CDFI generates between eight to $14 of private investment in that community. So if you're talking about return on investment, I mean, this is a very compelling case and it's part of why we really want to highlight CDFIs as a great place to get started on your, on your journey. Um, couple key facts. Um, there are over 1,300 certified CDFIs in all 50 states. They are quite varied. There are some that are well under 10 million in total assets, and there are others that are over a billion. Um, but they all have that responsibility to serve um, low-income and historically underserved populations. Um, in aggregate, CDFIs have over 220 billion, that's a B, billion in total assets. I remember the first time I heard this number, I thought, how could there be an industry this size I've never heard of? Well, the truth is that while it's a big number, it is still a niche industry within the overall financial services industry. I referenced this before, the repayment rate on loans that are made by CDFIs into underserved and low-income communities is on average over 98%. This is amazing. Um, these, this is a real testament to the connection CDFIs have with their communities and how they work with their customers and borrowers to succeed. They are accountable to their target market, as I mentioned, and all of you as investors, um, there is no specific industry number about the repayment rate to investors. I wish there were. But the, um, the re reported experience we hear from active investors is it's close to 100%. At one of our um, previous um, webinars, um, Mercy Partnership Fund shared that they have been investing in CDFIs for nearly 40 years, um, close to um, $100, $100 million of investments to, I believe, over 80 CDFIs over that period of time zero losses, 100% repayment rate. And that experience is what I hear 
uh, over and over again from religious institutions, from foundations, from um, impact investors about their investing experience. Um, it's very important to understand that there are four types of CDFIs. So there are about half of the total number of CDFIs are loan funds or venture funds. They are not insured or regulated. That gives them a lot of flexibility to be very nimble in their communities. Um, but only about 10% of them accept investments from individuals. And that actually is what really drove Babby and me to start our work identifying which are the loan funds that are open to individual and, um, and institutional investment. Um, and I'm gonna share more information on that very soon. Um, the types of investments in loan funds and venture, venture funds are investor notes, program related investments, equity and, um, and guarantees. Um, the other half of CDFIs are CDFI banks and credit unions. Um, they are insured and regulated. And this is um, the easiest way to put your money to work in a CDFI. Um, open a deposit account, open a CD. Um, there are other types of investments as well, but um, but this is a pretty um, you know, low risk, fully insured up to $250,000 way to get started on your, um, your investment journey. So I wanna go a little bit deeper now and talk about the types of investments. So, um, you know, breaking it down with loan funds. So we talked about, um, and I think you're gonna hear examples of this from both Emily and Diane, um, uh, investors can uh, invest in notes at a CDFI loan fund. Typically, these are one to 10 year terms, interest rates between one to 4%. And I'm gonna try <laughs> to link to this paper that um, Babby and I um, published and you can find it on the ASB and website and maybe somebody can put it in the chat right now. But, but this paper we talked about a lot of things we've already covered in this um, this webinar and the previous ones. We've got a lot of we've got sort of a step by step um, process to start your investment journey. A lot of resources to find CDFIs, but here we have compiled a list of over seventy CDFIs that have um, programs that make it very easy. Um, they're note programs that make it very easy for an individual or an institution to get started um, and to invest in their programs. We've got the contact information um, to be able to find their investor website, how to download the um, how to download the application, and um, and who to contact at that organization. And you can see we have it organized by. Um, we have it organized by state. And I'll just highlight here, we're gonna talk a little bit about OISTA soon. Um, we've got Capital for Change um, who presented at our last webinar. I'm, I'm an investor in Capital for Change and it was very simple. I went on their website, I filled out information. They had me download some paperwork, which I signed, sent in my check and they sent me a certificate. And, um, and I, you know, it's not, always that easy, but I think, um, I, you know, sometimes, um, it, you know, it may not be set up quite that easily, but I've got to tell you, that's been my experience with the CDFIs that, that I've, um, I've invested in. So um, I'm going to get out of this now and go back to the PowerPoint. Um, so are you all seeing, uh, I'm back to the PowerPoint now? Okay, great. Um, so um, there's also a couple of aggregators I wanted to highlight. Um, C-Note, you'll hear a little bit more about from Emily. Um, this is, I've got their website here that you can click to. And Spirix is another site that um, very, very large CDFIs um, have um, applied for a QCIP number. And these are um, investments that are available through brokers. Um, so I just wanted to make that visible to everyone. If you are a foundation, an endowment, or another 
institutional investor, I also want to highlight that um, program related investments are another way to um, to make an investment in a CDFI for impact. Um, they do count towards your 5% spending rule. Um, I've listed out here the IRS definition. I could tell you a lot more about this if you want to start down this path. But, but again, um, this is another way. Um, there's some, um, you know, it does require a little bit more due diligence, some loan agreement documentation to establish your fiduciary responsibility. But, um, but I do want to just make that visible. And believe it or not, there are a couple I believe it's only two, a couple of publicly traded CDFI loan funds, and I've listed their names here, and that's another way to, um, to invest in a CDFI loan fund. And then I want to break out the, um, the, uh, the investments in um, CDFI banks and credit unions, and I think we have a CDFI bank representative um, who's, on the, who's on the call today. Um, uh, let, let us know who, oh, there we go, Brent Trutman with the Native American Bank. And I know um, Emily might reference some investments that, that have been done um, in, in, in that um, wonderful CDFI bank. But CDFI um, banks and credit unions, again, you can make a deposit, um, you can buy a CD. Um, they are fully insured up to $250,000. So, you know, this is just a great way to put your cash to work, um, you know, at, at a bank that is really serving, um, serving communities that align with the goal of dismantling racism and inequality. Um, and then just lastly, I'll highlight there are very few, um, but there are some CDFI venture funds that have funds that are open to individuals. And I listed two here, um, CEI Venture in Maine has been doing venture um, investing um, for impact for decades now. And they've got really wonderful, wonderful organizations that, um, and businesses that they've invested in and you know, generated a lot of jobs in, uh, in communities that um, have really benefited. And then Launch New York is a fairly new CDFI venture fund that is doing a lot of very exciting work centered in Buffalo, um, New York. Most of these do require that um, the individual or institution is an accredited investor. So um, um, just to um, you know, take things one step further, um, you know, Due diligence, um, you know, starts to become an important topic the further down you go. And I just want to let everybody know that there is a model for evaluating financial sustainability. Um, oftentimes, um, new investors, they may be very sophisticated asset managers who have been asked to look at a CDFI or the credit department of a bank. Um, and they look at a CDFI and they say, whoa, what am I doing here? What's the model for evaluating the financial strength and sustainability? And I'm here to tell you there is a very straightforward model. It's called CAMEL, which stands for these five attributes. Um, there are very standard ways of evaluating ratios. I'd be happy to talk to anyone who wants to know more about this, but um, I've done a lot of training with um, with asset managers and credit credit folks. And um, they're very skeptical about investing in CDFIs when we start because they're looking at them as a commercial real estate deal or they're looking at them as a nonprofit. And neither of those is the right model for understanding the, um, um, the, the financial strength or, and sustainability of a CDFI. Once you explain CAMEL to them, they go, ah, I get it. Basically, this is the same model that regulators use to evaluate community banks and large banks. It's a very well-proven model that's been used for CDFIs for decades now. Um, there's another quick way to start your process, and that is to look at the CDFI fund. Remember, Department of the U.S. Treasury, look at their website, and they have a, um, a searchable database where you can find out the organizations that have received financial assistance awards. These are highly competitive annual awards 
And in order to qualify for them, they need to have a certain degree of financial compliance with what are called minimum prudent standards, which reflect this CAMEL model. And I'll just show you, um, I'll just show you what that looks like. Does everybody, Derek, maybe you could just nod for me if people are, are you seeing the searchable database site? I'm not actually. No. I'm still okay. seeing the PowerPoint. Okay, maybe I, okay, let me try that again. Okay. Um, so probably the previous things I shared also didn't come through, but so this is um, the CDFI fund website. Is that showing now, Derek? Okay. And you just go down here and, um, and I, I know it's a little confusing to see all these different programs, but I would start with the CDFI FA um, program because that's the most competitive that also looks at financial sustainability. And you can see down here, it lists out a couple hundred CDFIs, hundreds of CDFIs. And then if you wanted to limit it by state um, or even city, you could do a further filter. So, um, you know, I think this is just a great way to start, um, start your financial due diligence by looking at um, the CDFI fund website because they have already um, done a lot of, um, a lot of, the, of the analysis. So I'm back to the PowerPoint now, I hope. And, um, and then just lastly, I would just point out ARIS, which is a wonderful organization that all they do is evaluate um, CDFI loan funds in terms of um, uh, their core business. And so I, I have their website there that I hope you'll take a look at. Um, so, um, you know, lastly, I'll just say that on the ASBN website, we have um, a lot of resources, including the paper I, um, I, I thought I was showing you all. Um, but um, actually, maybe I'll just do that two seconds right now, if you don't mind, since I thought I was sharing it before, and it turns out I, I wasn't. Um, I'll just uh, try to pull that up quickly. Um, I'm sorry about that. Let me... Um, Um, there it is. Okay. There, there it is. Okay. Um, so are you seeing the paper now? I thought, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So this is yeah. the paper that, um, Babby and I, um, this is actually the second edition that we published earlier this year. And, um, and so I'd really urge everyone to download it off the ASBN website, and maybe we'll put a link to it in the website, but it gives a lot of background on what CDFI is. In fact, a lot of what we've covered in this webinar gives a step-by-step -step on how to start your journey, find a CDFI that is in your market or aligns with your interests, evaluate and invest. And then we urge everyone to consider supporting them philanthropically as well. Um, We've got the listing of some webinars we've done, as well as a whole bunch of wonderful trade associations and collaborations that might align with your specific interests. So for instance, if you're interested in Appalachia, there's a wonderful um, a wonderful coalition of, of um, Appalachian CDFI. If you're interested in CDFIs led by African-American leaders, there's a wonderful alliance of of CDFIs led by African Americans that are doing amazing work. So just some examples of the types of resources that we list out here. And then here's the inventory that we've done. Um, you can see that what we do is that we have the name of the loan fund, the state where it's headquartered, the contact information, whether um, they take all investors or they limit their investments to accredited investors, and then when the information was most recently updated. And so, you know, as I said, we have over 70 CDFI loan funds and we'd, we'd really encourage um, you to consider downloading this paper and using this as a way to get, get started. So um, I think with that, I'll, I'll come back to the, the PowerPoint and, um, and turn it over to um, our next presenter. Derek, maybe I'll let you, um, I'll let you, uh, introduce um, our next speaker and I'll bring up the PowerPoint again. 
Sure. So, next, well, first, I want to thank you, Pam. Uh, that was very, very informative, um, even for me. Uh, so really appreciate you walking us through that. And so, yes, we have uh, two panelists here to speak with you tonight. And I would like to introduce our first panelist, uh, Emily Beckman. And she is with the Universal, sorry, I'm getting that wrong. So I'll just let you go ahead. Unitarian Universalist. So Emily, go ahead, take us away. Hi. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so my name is Emily Beckman. Um, I am a member of the Endowment Fund Committee at uh, First Universalist Church of Denver, uh, Colorado. So very excited to be here. Um, so just a bit of my, my own story. Um, I am... Uh, I, I do not necessarily have the same level of um, experience, history, and, and background as, uh, you know, some of the amazing people that you have heard from and will be hearing from. So I am kind of coming at this from the, oh my goodness, you know, I am really excited about this realm of community investing, what it, what it is and what it can do and how, how it can help um, uh, in, in alignment with, um, your ultimate, uh, your ultimate goals. Um, so, you know, just from, from my perspective, as, as I had already started to think about, you know, okay, so there are certain stores that I don't want to go to, that I don't want to, you know, shop at because I don't want to give them my money, gosh, darn it. And it's, to me, this is the next, um, in, in some ways, logical step of, well, okay, so how are you going to be, um, how are we going to be investing money as, as individuals? And of course, um, as, as an endowment fund um, at First Universalist. Um, so especially right now for us, um, we very recently back in May um, adopted the, uh, the eighth principle um, journeying toward spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. So especially um, uh, as, we, as we have adopted um, very officially this, this principle, um, community investing becomes more and more important um, for who we are, who we want to be, and who we are working towards um, and is already in line with, of course, the, the remainder, the first seven principles. Um, so one, one of our biggest responsibilities um, as, as part of the, the endowment committee is um, kind of first uh, uh, aligning ourselves with um, our investing, our money, our dollars, with our, our mission, um, principles, and, and faith. And then communicating that as well um, to, to both our, our, our members, um, communicating and hand in hand with, with the board um, to help understand that community investing is really in, in line with who we are, with who we are striving to be, um, breaking down some of the misconceptions that it isn't, this isn't um, charity, this isn't a uh, uh, ESG investing, and it's it definitely isn't a you know a wildly rash decision that will cause the endowment fund to vanish overnight. Um, so ultimately, our our goal is to have this and uh, the dollars that we are investing aligned with our mission and vision, um, with with our faith. Um, so moving on to the next slide. So our um, our operating principle is uh, so in, in bold here and to be a, a spiritual home for building the beloved community um, inside and outside um, our walls. So as, as Tom referenced um, a little bit, if you uh, have, have joined us for some of the earlier presentations um, and as Derek was also speaking about a bit earlier, um, uh, beloved community is, is what we are, what we're trying to build here um, through, uh, through, community, through community investing. Um, next, next slide, please. Okay, 
so what what this looked like for us in practice, and I, I apologize um, for the um, I, I packed a little bit in here, um, but we we first one of the earliest steps for us um, was reviewing our investment guidelines and making um, making an update there. So our original guidelines um, were kind of focused on um, so picking out some of the this is not a comprehensive list but um, you know in order of priority investment goals shall be to protect the principal invest uh, consistent with the purpose and then to generate income and capital gains that can be applied to appropriate church activities um, restricting endowment investments to common financial instruments such as stocks bonds mutual funds treasury bills commercial paper um, and avoiding non-liquid investments uh, and so it was really saying, okay, how how can we, um, because we should be, our guidelines are directing principles, how can we revise these to um, line up with what we're really trying to do here? So our, our current guidelines, um, the purpose of the fund is to further the mission and vision of First Universalist, both in how the funds are invested and spent. Um, some of our criteria when we are looking at funds to invest in would be um, right relationship within the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part, pulling directly um, from our Unitarian Universalist uh, principles, um, the advancement of social, cultural, and environmental capital in addition to financial capital. Um, so recognizing that um, the ROI can be uh, measured in in many different uh, uh, ways. It's not always point, point A to point B. Um, and of course, we do still have um, listed on our on our guidelines, excuse me, um, included in our guidelines as it is still incredibly important, um, the anticipated financial returns and risk to the principle of funds. Um, so we're, we're, we're bringing the two together. It is, it is not a mutually um, exclusive endeavor. Um, so we're we're moving away from kind of the traditional way of of, of viewing you know the, the endowment that money as as somehow uh, separate from um, our mission and principles, something that stands alone. To really integrating our our mission, our values, and our principles into everything that we do, we are paying attention to the the complete. ROI that you know eight to, to fourteen dollar return that that Pam mentioned. Um, and next slide, please. So our our current investments um, right now, um, we we are invested in the Oista uh, Corporation, which is a native uh, CDFI intermediary. Um, so they have a minimum investment threshold of 25,000, which can make it a, a little bit more difficult um, for individual investors, but can potentially be a really great option for um, endowment funds. And we did decide to move forward here with a $25,000 um, investment uh, in the form of a promissory note um, over five years at a 1% annual uh, interest rate. Um, so the the process here of um, kind of doing doing our, our, our due diligence um, before investing in um, OISTA, um, so in part involved, um, of course, uh, an in-depth review of the OISTA um, papers, annual reports, um, a, a due diligence group pulling together um, members um, and interested investors who were part of um, uh, first, first Universalist members um, and members of other churches and individuals who were interested um, to pull together some questions and then meet directly with um, the investor relations and kind of CFO um, representative directly from um, OISTA. And digging into questions um, such as like, like looking at their OISTA's investments, their, their losses, um, the, the impact, of course, what, any, what if any losses investors had um, experienced, what some of their biggest challenges were, um, what their long-term strategic plans um, were. So asking those questions. Um, we are also um, currently in the process 
of taking advantage of the um, Unitarian Universalist, uh, the Common Endowment um, Fund matching uh, contribution. So the UUCEF will match um, up to $10,000 um, contributed uh, or, or um, uh, in community investing, um, which is awesome. So definitely something to uh, to keep in mind for for you use out there. Um, excited to be able to to take advantage of that. Um, we are also, and this is um, on the agenda um, as we're kind of kind of fleshing out. Our Green First Committee is doing some additional investigation here, but um, we'll be investing in solar panels at. Our, our, at our church. Um, it'll be kind of agreed upon up to $25,000 um, over 15 years at a 1.5% annual um, interest rate. And then, so this isn't, um, this isn't part of our, uh, uh, of our endowment fund, but um, I did, I did want to uh, put it on here that we have also moved, um, uh, 50,000 in our reserve funds in the first few reserve funds to um, C note as as Pam did did mention before. So C note is a, a B Corp um, investing in CDFIs. Uh, so they are you know uh, the, um, not a CDFI directly themselves, but in some ways making it easier for investors, kind of tapping that easy button and having access that you might not otherwise uh, to CDFIs. Um, so we are invested in the uh, the flagship fund, which does not have a minimum uh, investment requirement. So can also be a really great option for um, individuals as well. Um, it has up to a 2% um, return and uh, does provide quarterly liquidity, um, which is great as well. Um, next, uh, next one, please. Thank you. So what, what are our, our next steps as, um, as the endowment fund committee? So it's, it's important that we continue to uh, really educate and communicate um, amongst uh, our own, um, our own church, um, continue to conduct uh, investment research and uh, diversification into actually different areas of um, impact. Uh, CDFIs that are focusing in in different uh, in different well realms. We're going to be utilizing some of the amazing resources from this series as well, of course. Uh, um, and then uh, making investment recommendations to, to the board um, of our church as we implement them and carry on. So really our, our main goal here and our ultimate objective is just to be aligning our, our investments, our money um, with our mission, our values, our principles, um, kind of who we are, who we want to be in the world that we want to live in. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. That was uh, very, very informative and really appreciate you taking the time to share with us. Um, just a reminder that uh, after our next panelists, we're gonna open up for questions for the participants, for any of the panelists uh, and Pam as well. And so with that, I would like to introduce Diane Keefe. Diane, take it away. Thanks, everybody. Um, I really appreciate Emily's talk uh, because it reminds me that we might be able to influence our internal large manager, which is called Friends Fiduciary Corporation, and is headquartered in Philadelphia, to actually do that kind of a matching program with uh, Quaker congregations um, in different parts of the country. Uh, so this kind of cross fertilization is really helpful. So New York quarterly meeting um, is an old fashioned term for the New York City metro area Quaker communities uh, and their assets are pooled. And I'm on the investment committee of that pool. And uh, you're seeing a picture of the Manhattan um, meeting complex where Friends Seminary is headquartered and um, this building was originally, it, 
this is this is the second building that was established, but the first building that was established for Friends Seminary was so black kids and white kids could uh, learn together before there was a public school system in New York City. So back in the day, the Quakers were really, really revolutionary. Um, but um, these days, uh, these endowments um, are primarily there to make sure that these old buildings, which are historical, uh, don't have holes in their roofs and the city of New York calling us up and saying, you're not maintaining your buildings. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, Quakers have a, um, a bunch of um, values that they attach to their investments going back uh, actually centuries. Um, and it, it goes by our testimonies, which are um, characterized by the acronym SPICES, and it stands for simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, and stewardship. So stewardship, of course, has applications to the investment business, but equality is what we're talking about here because most of the list of securities in the old uh, investment policy statement that Emily brought up and in frankly, most investment policy statements in the world, uh, it confines investors to very large companies uh, that either have publicly traded stocks or publicly traded bonds and which often completely reinforce white privilege. And so uh, community development investing is addressing equity. So we can go to the next slide. So I, I just wanted to give you a high level picture of our portfolio uh, because it shows the dynamics of an investment committee. Um, investment committees are political institutions. And so you have varying degrees of commitment uh, and varying different ways of thinking about risk. And so um, this is where our committee is at this point. Um, and Friends Fiduciary invests in both stocks and bonds. But the other thing that Quakers have long uh, been known for is that they do not invest in certain industries. So uh, alcohol, tobacco, military weapons contractors, uh, companies that are famous for abuse of employees and casinos. Uh, they also look very askance at companies that are on the top 100 air polluters or water polluters or hazardous waste polluters. And so they've been doing that kind of exclusionary investing for decades. And there are many other um, denominations that also have similar social criteria, but the ESG movement, the environmental, social, and governance movement was uh, as a counterweight to that saying that uh, rather than just investing in everything that can make money, uh, what you should really do is not exclude whole industries like the Quakers do, but instead rank every company in every industry based on how responsible a citizen it is. In other words, how it manages its employees, even if it's in the military industry, you know, does it have a female CEO or a black CEO? Well, then maybe we can put it with a high ranking in, in that category, even if it's the product itself is, is destructive. So um, we have balanced both those traditional ways of managing social criteria and the purism um, that we continue to have about certain industries. And this portfolio is an example of that. So uh, the majority of our funds, that's 16.3 million is in Friends Fiduciary and Friends Fiduciary has multiple different funds that only, only Quakers are allowed to invest in but there's a balanced fund which has both stocks and bonds in it. So it effectively um, makes the asset allocation decision uh, based on how much risk a whole other investment committee is evaluating in the stock market versus the bond market. And the bond market will go up and down with interest rates, but not as much as the stock market. So that is considered less risky. 
So that is called the Growth and Income Fund. And in response to pressures from our uh, congregation level, which we call Quaker meetings, uh, we have a consensus building process and up bubbled the need to divest from fossil fuels. So that came about both in response to anti-racism and in response to climate change, that um, we were slow in our uh, consensus building process to characterize ourselves as a, um, an anti-racist community, uh, which in, in the New York area, I believe only happened in 2020 or 2021, though some members had been working on racial justice issues since well before the civil rights movement in the 60s. Um, so our consensus building process uh, has finally you know, been enlightened by the George Floyd murder and other things to the point where we became uh, more committed to, to this work. At the same time, we were investing in community investments and uh, that total vanguard there is um, mortgage-backed securities. So uh, publicly traded bond funds that are in mortgage-backed securities that are described as Fannie Mae's, Freddie Mac's, or Ginny Mae's are all invested in low and moderate income housing. And so we've thought of that as a broadly socially responsible category. Um, but the community investments themselves, we're gonna go into a little more detail later, are actually CDFI investments. And then the total Morgan Stanley is actually bond investments in the federal agencies that actually um, issue these low and moderate income loans through the mortgage-backed securities market, Fannie Mae's, Ginny Mae's, and Freddie Max. So, um, and we can talk about that more in detail. An amalgamated bank is a labor bank. Uh, it is, uh, its board it is developed with labor, union labor friendly um, uh, members. And so we keep our cash in that. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Can we make that bigger? Oop, that's a little too big. <laughs> okay, that's that's okay. So um, this uh, is our list of specific um, community development investments. Opportunity Finance Network is a network of community development financial institutions that also has its own fund. Uh, so similar to that C note, except this is a, a nonprofit industry association, um, Opportunity Finance Network is headquartered in Philadelphia and represents a lot of different CDFIs at different sizes and with different purposes, but they have their own fund and that fund invests in the member organizations. Um, Partners for the Common Good is a syndicator of projects. When CDFIs are doing projects, they will often risk share when the projects are too big for one particular one to do. And so Partners for the Common Good, uh, which is headquartered in Washington, DC, is um, in the business of sort of filling in the gap when, um, when a project is too big for one or two CDFIs to complete. And low, low Income Investment Fund is on the West Coast, and it's one of the biggest CDFIs. Uh, and um, when we were looking at these, uh, we benefited from, I used to be on the board of Opportunity Finance Network, so I was familiar with a lot of the um, different CDFIs that are leaders in the industry. And also just a little more background um, from what Pam was talking about, uh, a lot of the genesis of the CDFI industry came from a, a reaction by the federal government to redlining by large commercial banks. And so in those same communities that were excluded from getting loans from the big banks, they were required by the Community Reinvestment Act to invest in those communities. And a lot of them didn't know how to do it. And so this whole sort of cottage industry 
built up in various different geographies to serve those communities on a nonprofit basis and do it better than the big banks because there are different objectives involved. You know, big banks really just want to make a lot of money for the, themselves and CDFIs really want to make a lot of money for those communities and keep it in those communities. So um, that's the context. Um, and Leviticus Fund is the, the only one that we invest in that is um, specialized in the New York metro area. And that is part of our mission is also to try to ground ourselves where we live. Uh, the New York quarterly meeting is just the meetings in Staten Island, Queens, uh, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Manhattan. So uh, Leviticus Fund is operating there. And I, I would like to, uh, so the total of this is 2.4 million, but that Connecticut Green Bank, lastly, um, at the top, is um, an $800,000 investment in a $30 million bond issue that was done by the Connecticut Green Bank. And uh, these are public bonds, but they're a very small issue. 30 million is a very small issue for a bond issue. So they're very um, illiquid, but uh, we did it because we knew that the multiplier effect of this is really substantial. And um, it is um, literally funding the expansion of solar energy in the state of Connecticut. Um, and they also require energy efficiency audits before anybody gets uh, a loan for solar energy that has um, tax benefits, both federal and state tax benefits in the state of Connecticut. So um, we are very motivated about uh, climate solutions related companies because uh, BIPOC communities are the most negatively affected by the climate crisis. As it accelerates, uh, people who are vulnerable are going to get hit the worst, um, as we've seen, you know, in Hurricane Sandy, certainly in in our area and all over the world. Um, people who are uh, vulnerable and don't have assets in many places, as opposed to just where they live, um, will not be able to adapt to it as well as people in the upper income echelon, and so from a context point of view in the United States, 60% of the population is living paycheck to paycheck. And I don't know what the percentage is, um, but it's a relatively high percentage of people who, if they had an unanticipated $500 expense, um, would really struggle with it. So we are dealing with a lot of um, low wealth people in this country, let alone the world. And, um, and climate change is really gonna be a number on those communities. So to the degree that we can slow it by what we do with our investments, um, we're, we're, we've got a mandate from the body to, to do more about that. Uh, that said, I will be frank and say there are some people on our committee that say fracking is making a lot of money for people, Quakers in, in uh, Pennsylvania and everybody in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so we have the same debate that, that they have in the Democratic Party. It's not the same debate that we have in the Republican Party, but it's, it's the debate that we think climate change is real, but how quickly do we want to transfer out of natural gas, which is supposedly the transition fuel, um, is, is up for debate even within the investment committee. So if we could just go back to that previous slide for a minute, I just want to highlight um, that, yeah, that one. Their friend's fiduciary um, actually created a, um, a fund called the Green Impact Fund that is a, a pure stock fund that has three different managers that are focused on um, stocks that will respond to the climate crisis and make more money for their products and services if the climate crisis, with, with solutions to the climate, climate crisis or in response to creating better resiliency around it. So um, we did uh, agitate for the creation of that fund. And also it, we were one of the significant larger investors in that fund when it was created. So if you want more information on that, you can go to the Friends Fiduciary website and uh, get information about that. Uh, still the lion's share of the assets is in the um, 
the Quaker Growth and Income Fund, which is a balanced fund and has some exposure to the green fund, but it's not the green fund itself. So, you know, there are compromises in everything you do, uh, but my goal is that eventually we are similar to the Heron Foundation, which is 100% impact across the asset allocation from deployment of cash all the way to private equity, that we are cognizant and concerned with the social impact and the racial impact of every investment we make. Um, so I think, um, I, oh, one more point. Uh, can we go back to the community investment slide? If you look at the maturities and the interest rates on the right side in that column on the right, yeah. So you can see that the maturities are short, you know, um, one to four years, even the, um, at this point, um, the uh, 2027 is five years and that's the bond that we have. So all of our community development investments uh, mature relatively um, soon. And they were invested in at a time where um, from a fiduciary point of view, uh, the official definition of fiduciary is to invest as a prudent, I'm not gonna say it man, prudent person would invest. Um, and for many years, okay, I have been an advocate. I have a CFA, which is like a, a CPA for the investment business. And there were a bunch of us who said that we do need to take into consideration the social criteria because you actually avoid risks of doing something that will become illegal, even if it isn't illegal when you first start doing it, because society realizes how bad what you're doing is. In other words, for instance, tobacco. <laughs> you know, tobacco was something that finally, after a long time, they realized, oh my God, this is cancer causing. Even the government realized it. And so it's basically trying to identify liabilities like that from the behavior of corporations. Well, another way of looking at um, fiduciary responsibility is what is your return for the risk you're taking? So all of these institutions, even though they're relatively large uh, compared to most um, CDFIs, are much smaller than most of the stocks and bonds that you would invest in. Uh, and so that in itself is considered a serious risk um, because small entities have small cushions for things going wrong. Uh, but that said, um, Pam did illustrate the, the fact, which is that they've got decades of history of losing not much. So, um, so there's two factors. One is risk and the other is return. And so they have been very good at returning your principal. Um, and they give you a small interest rate, as you can see, uh, none of them are over 3%. Um, but that was in an interest rate environment where very few um, securities in the uh, less than four year maturity were giving you 3%. So we were prepared to accept um, those interest rates in that environment. And you can see that the Unitarians actually gave five years at 1%. So they're giving a concessionary rate relative to market rates even before the Fed started raising interest rates. So one needs to balance as a fiduciary how much money we need to make. And that begins to be an ethical question. And the Quakers actually um, you know, have been good stewards of our assets relative to what we need to maintain our buildings and, um, and do you know, the projects that we need to do. Uh, and another part of it was we actually decided to renovate our huge facilities for energy efficiency so that we are not spending as much on fossil fuels through our utility bills and our oil bills and, um, and have that as our investment in um, you know, basically uh, trying to create a closer to fossil fuel free future so that we can all survive. So, um, That is 
oh, the other thing, I just want to share a screen for a second and show you an example of the underlying portfolio of the, um, let me just see how I can do this. Uh, yeah, let me see if I can bring this up here. So this is an example of one of the projects. Uh, this is on West 96th Street, 97th Street, where, near where I used to live. Um, and it's a hotel conversion to create affordable housing. It's, um, it's basically, studies have indicated that it's much better for homeless people to have like a, an SRO kind of environment, except they actually have their own cooking facilities and they have a simple place that's really theirs. Um, and it's structured affordably. And this one is through the Fortune Society, which has been um, working with reentry for a long time. Um, so 85 units, 67 will house homeless individuals who have histories of involvement with the criminal justice system. And they're managing this so that people can stabilize. Uh, and so this is part of what we do because we live in New York City. And this is not only a good investment that we will make a decent return on for, and we continue to roll it over at maturity. So it's not like we're only giving it to them for two years, but every two years we get to reevaluate at what interest rate we're comfortable investing. Uh, and so this is, you know, one example of what they put our money into. And, um, and this is definitely, you know, a, a great example of how CDFIs will actually um, deploy the capital in ways that will uh, reduce the risks actually in the lives of the people who live in New York City, as well as benefiting the homeless people um, that get the units. So I'll end with that. Thank you, Diane. And I think you can probably stop sharing your, yeah, there you go. Okay. Thank you, really appreciate it. Um, we're at 8.45 now, and so still wanted to open up some time for questions, but um, real quick, Pam, if you're still with us, are there any takeaways that you would like to comment on before we open it up for questions? I think you're muted if you're if you're talking. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. No, Diane and Emily, you just did a great job um, just sharing the journey and um, uh, you know, just 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 get started. You may not feel like an expert, but you learn along the way. Thanks, Pam. All right. Well, so we have about uh, 10 minutes. And so we have a, uh, let's see, yeah, about 12 for 10, about twelve of us that are still on. So I would like to open it up for any questions or comments or anything that, that struck you about what you heard. Um, the floor is open if anyone, since we have a small number, uh, feel free to, to just unmute yourself and, and start asking. And if, if people start talking at the same time, then I'll, I'll jump in and have you all take turns. Any questions, feedback, comments for the panelists? I'll speak. Hi, everybody. Sure. Um, Hi, I'm Jill Marcus, and I, uh, I'm with the Unitarian Congregation at Shelter Rock in Manhasset, New York, and um, I'm on our SRI committee. We don't give out grants, we give out loans and work with CDFIs. And I really appreciate, I've appreciated all of these. I've been to everyone in the series. And I really appreciate learning about um, the different kinds of opportunities that you all in your own congregations and worlds have invested in because there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. And I now have a list of some amazing organizations that have been vetted by all of you and have proven themselves with you know, interest rates and returns on investment. Um, so we have a lot of food for thought to go back to our congregation and try to 
you know, get some meetings with some of the uh, organizations. I was particularly interested in learning about investing in those companies that are helping with other problems. For example, you just spoke about the Fortune Society and Diane, and um, and it's interesting that they work with reentry, but the focus of investment would be the Fortune Society. So investing in companies that are helping to do good in the world and in New York City, especially, uh, which is where we are, the greater New York area, is a wonderful thing. And it's not so easy to always find out those companies that are investing in in certain uh, organizations and populations. So this has been really helpful. Thank you for everything. It's a treasure. Thank you for your comments, Jill. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, any other comments, questions? I have one. Um, so we've developed a good resource for identifying CDFIs, but do CDFIs uh, generally stick to their geographic region? And um, what if what if someone wants to invest in their community where there's where there's a not a CDFI that that actually exists? Any one of the panelists or Pam? Yeah, you know, this whole issue of um, of um, coverage is is one that um, often comes up. Um, you may be interested in small business and reaching um, BIPOC entrepreneurs, but it might be that there's not a small business CDFI in your community. And um, maybe there's a great housing lender, but you know those skill sets are very different. Um, so you know that that um, it is possible to start talking with um, small business lenders that are in nearby communities, um, because if they if they see that there are um, partners that they can work with and there's an unmet need um, that is in that community. Um, they, they like to work with community partners to understand what that unmet need is and um, uh, you know, deploy some of their, their funding, perhaps raise new funding to be able to, to move into the geography. So, um, I, I actually recently, um, uh, you know, I, I've seen a lot of geographic expansion lately. I, I've seen, um, we've talked about climate change quite a bit today. There's a wonderful CDFI in Florida called Solar Energy Loan Fund, and they really focus on home improvements. So working with low income, people with disabilities, veterans um, to, help them address leaky roofs and you know replacing um air conditioners that don't work um putting ramps in you know addressing um uh you know widening a bathroom for uh so someone can stay in their home you know you know the average loan is seven thousand dollars and then they work with contractors especially BIPOC contractors to help them develop the skills to be certified to do those home repairs. It's, it's just mm -hmm. fantastic. And they started in one county in Florida. They're now in most of the state and they're now moving to Alabama and Georgia. And, um, you know, they, they're all green bank also, you know, they've, they've, um, you know, they, they started in a small geography. They, Proved their model, and now I think we're going to see them grow pretty, um, pretty rapidly to other geographies. Um, but, um, but you know, they they tend to like to, you know, they're moving into Georgia with support from a couple of partnerships and a foundations giving them some support and you know their own strategic plan 
supports their geographic expansion. But, um, you know, like anything, it's a relationship with an organization. Hmm. Also, I just wanted to share that um, Self-Help Credit Union has a um, product that helps people who are undocumented get uh -huh. access to capital. And, yeah. um, you know, that's an area where there's so much discrimination against people. And, you know, that is the ultimate of exclusion that, you know, if you're an illegal, um, you don't get access to the banking system. So, um, and they have been a leading institution on a bunch of matters. Um, so I think that there are uh, different foci and the other, uh, institution that I would put a plug in for is um, Calvert Group will uh, somewhat bundle for you if you say, you know, I want to, I want to invest in BIPOC women on the West Coast, or, you know, you, you can, you can um, decide what you want to prioritize, and they'll help you find it. But the other thing is um, just a, a plug for wherever you sit, once you get going on this yourself, and once you have more than a toe in the water, you can also uh, prod your own financial advisor to develop expertise in this or seek out expertise that they can partner with so that not only can they serve you better, but they can serve their client base better um, because more, especially young people, really don't want to do things the way they the way it used to be done, where you basically did your charity work and then you did your investments and you didn't, never the twain shall meet. And more and more, like they say that people under 35 just will not engage with many businesses that have bad records. And um, that wasn't necessarily the case for our generation. So, um, I think that there are new instruments that are being developed. For instance, there's a company called Raise Green that is raising money for solar projects. And you can go in and you know read about the project and decide if you wanna give them a loan for 7% and you can put in 10,000 or you can put in a hundred. Uh, and there's another company that, that we've, uh, that some of us as individuals have invested in called Honeycomb, which is going into, communities and working with their restaurants and their, you know, their green uh, dry cleaners and their bakeries and helping them expand uh, with debt capital. And they help them raise it from their supply chains and from their customers. And what they find is through pulling the community together in support of a business, they actually have been able to raise the revenue of that business in the subsequent year by 60%. Uh, and the guy who founded it used to work at FICO. So he's really good at evaluating businesses um, for their ability to repay. So these are more uh, these are more risky investments, but I'm just saying, I think that this is a very juicy area of uh, innovation and, and it hasn't yet gotten to the scale of the capital markets. You're not gonna find it in stocks and bonds, but it is growing these kinds of new institutions. And an older one is called Kiva, and it is a micro lending individual by individual, but that kind of Kiva idea is also blossoming in many different ways um, with entrepreneurs in the financial services industry above and beyond CDFIs. And so once you're in this realm, encouraging any financial advisor that works um, with you to get more well-educated on the risks and, and rewards of, of this kind of activity, um, given alignment with your mission, uh, would, would be prudent. Yeah, and I would just add um, one due diligence question, um, especially as you, I mean, some of the aggregators Diane mentioned are just terrific. One question to always ask is, um, and what is the price of capital you are charging the end mm. user? So that, um, you know, I think Emily's example of um, the 1% investment in Awista is so powerful because that means 
a least this cost of capital for that that borrowed those borrowed funds is one percent, which means they can lend it out to their borrowers at a low rate. And um, so there's always there's a little bit of a balance if um, if a if the investor is getting seven percent, what is the end borrower getting? And so um, you know that's just it's just part of your due diligence question. And there's a continuum. There are going to be some things where you say we can take it at one percent, have that below market rate. There are going to be other times where the impact is great enough, the business model supports it. We're okay to get a um, a market market rate of return. So, mm. Mm. well, thank you. More? And yes, Jill, go ahead. Um, for those of us looking for particular areas of concern to invest in locally, in particular disability, um, I really loved hearing about the Solar Energy Loan Fund in Florida, but we're in the greater New York area and even in New York State. Do you all have any ideas about how you go about finding or vetting uh, companies that are dealing with particular issues? In my case, I'm looking for disability uh, supporting organizations similar to solar energy, but that are local. Uh, what resources would you look at to tap into that particular market? Yeah, you know, actually, Jill, um, the group that Diane mentioned, Leviticus Fund, they've got a great track record of supporting um, programs that um, support people with disabilities in a wide variety of areas. But why don't we touch base afterwards? Because I can um, I can connect you with um, a number of CDFIs. Um, the Disability Opportunity Fund, right there in New York, does okay. a lot of remarkable work um, in a wide variety of ways with people with disabilities. But I, I I've got a whole list for you. Happy to share it with you. I would love that. Thank you very much, Pam. I'll I'll put my info, and you can put yours in the uh... yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, we're at the end of our time. It is nine o'clock Eastern time. And so I wanted to thank you all for participating. We're going to be meeting again on November 14th. And this is just going to be kind of an open discussion of, of people who want to join to just kind of talk through with us how we can expand this series into other areas of, of faith-based community investing. And so if you all have the time, um, we would love to have you all there. I will drop a link to the registration if you do want to attend. Um, that's the link to our website that you can go ahead and register for that event. And, um, and, and hope to see you there on November 14th. And uh, last, before we depart, I just want to give a, a big thank you um, to Diane, uh, Emily, and Pam. Um, I learned <laughs> a great wealth of information that I actually want to follow up with all of you all on, uh, even though we work together. But um, so just wanted to thank you all for your time. I know it's uh, evening, and, and so it's getting kind of late, uh, at least on the East Coast. But um, this is the reason why we have done this work is just so we can be informed and um, so we can also educate and, and communicate about these different alternative forms of investment. And so we appreciate you all for joining. And with that, I will let you all off for the evening. Thank you.